the posthumous work of St. Yves de Vedre entitled Mission of Lind, which was published in 1910, contains the description of a mysterious initiatory center designated under the name Agartha. But many readers of this book should assume that it was nothing more than a purely imaginary story, a kind of fiction that not resting on anything real. Indeed, if you want to take everything at face value, there are some improbabilities that, at least for those who stick to outward appearances, could justify such an appreciation. And as in doubt St. Eve had good reasons to not show himself this work, written for quite some time, and that really was not set up. Moreover, until then, Europe had not done just mention Agartha and his boss, Brahmatma, rather than the writer Louis J. Elliot. It is believed that he had heard really talk about these things in the course of his stay in India, but later had managed an eminently fanciful way. But in 1924, there was an unexpected fact, the book entitled Beasts, Men, Gods, in which Ferdinand Asendowski account the adventures of a rough trip he made in 1920 and 1921 through Central Asia, contains, especially in the last part, almost identical to those of St. Eve's stories, and noise occurred around this book provides a favorable opportunity to break the silence on the issue of Agartha. Alejandro St. Eve del Vedre 1842-1909 French occultist and author of the Archeometer, the Theogony of the Patriarchs and a collection of texts entitled The Mission Jews, French, etc. They cover major historical periods and addresses issues with unusual depth, revealing the master. There are those who consider it a member of the Sang Agartha of the time. Although his language is clear, the use of neologisms and reference to concepts of theogony and cosmogony, difficult to understand the contents. It was guide to distinguishing disciples, such as Gerard Enkel Aus Pappas, founder of the Martinist Order, and C.H. G. the architect director of the Archeometric Plains. Both were members of the civil society The Friends of St. Eve. The key to the archaeometer is taken up by other authors, such as Dr. Serge Raynaud de la Ferrière, founder of the GFU, who applies it in the books Yuj, Yoga, Yogfismo and their great messages. Fernando Asendowski, in his book Beasts, Men, Gods, says an unknown prophecy for the vast majority of people, but no less disturbing. It was announced as the text says, the late 19th century to the lamas of a Buddhist monastery in Asia. And it was written by the author of the book mentioned at the beginning of the 20th century, as stated in the editorial records. In analyzing this prophecy detail we can observe interesting similarities with that occurred during the 20th century and chilling predictions that should happen in this century events. The text is as follows. The Hachuktu of Nurabanshi told me the following, when I had occasion to visit him in his monastery at the beginning of 1921, while the king of the world appeared to the lamas of our monastery, favored by God, thirty years ago, he made a prophecy concerning the coming years, which among other things says, Then come eighteen years of war and cataclysms. Then the peoples of Agardi will leave their underground caverns, and will appear on the surface of the earth. Agartha, also known or called Agarthi, Agarda or Agartha, is, according to the Eastern tradition, a kingdom made up of many underground tunnels that connect dozens of interterrestrial cities inhabited by beings of a high level of knowledge that guard and preserve planetary evolution. Different cultures around the world have made important references about this mystery especially in Asia. The geographical location of its capital, called Shambhala, would be under the Gobi Desert. These theories are as old as mankind and some legends speak of underground kingdom of Agartha, which is under the mountains of Tibet. It has been said many times, that as discussed UFOs do not come from space, but have their bases in the interior of the Earth, 
leaving out precisely because the two openings that exist in both poles. There lives the superior race, the same one day will rise to annihilate us. This theory, defended two centuries ago by the English Bulwer Lytton, it would be accepted by philosophers of Nazism, who would show convinced of the existence of an inner sun. This sun will illuminate a hollow earth, whose inhabitants would be Aryan race, and hate to death those who live in the planet's surface. The myth of the secret in the depths of the earth world leads us to the Brahmin religion. In the book The King of the World 1927, the French esoteric Ren Egu e non a lot of old traditions, that speak of a holy land located in legendary places such as Atlantis, the kingdom of Prester John or the castle of Camelot on among others. Rene Gnon or Ab al Wahid Yaya 1886-1951 was a mathematician, philosopher and metaphysician French. Mathematical profession is known for its publications philosophical and spiritual effort for the conservation and dissemination of spiritual tradition. I have been based largely on the works of this eminent philosopher to write this article, especially in his work The King of the World. Anyway, I recommend the reader to read his works, which are of great erudition. He was associated with Ananda Kumaraswamy, another great Anglo-Indian metaphysician of the first half of the 20th century. Rene Gnan, great student of Eastern doctrines and religions, endeavored to make the West a non-simplistic view of Eastern thought, particularly India and his defense of traditional civilizations against the West. Highlights its critique of Western civilization from metaphysical assumptions and not ideological or political. The study of his books about Hinduism is essential for all, those who want to delve into the tradition. Rene Gnan, only son of Jean Baptiste, architect, and Anna Lentini Jolly, born in Bliss on 15 November 1886. It takes place in the city of childhood and adolescence totally normal, receiving early education from his maternal aunt, governess, and then continuing it in the school of Notre Dame Dades, led by religious. In 1902 he passed to Augustine Thury College and the following year received bachelor's S. Lettres Philosophie. In 1904 he goes to Paris, to follow an academic course in Higher Mathematics College Rollin. However, in 1906 about interrupted his university studies, because, it is said, their health, which apparently was already quite delicate since childhood. After the interruption of academic studies began to run a non-rich in meetings and in written fruitful period, however, it is extremely difficult to collect certain evidence about their relationships, complex, and often generated for reasons that were directly related to the development of his written work, particularly in the aspect of clarification and condemnation of pseudo-doctrines occultists and theosophists. In the period from 1906 to 1909 Rene Gnon frequents the Hermetic School, directed by Pappas, and is admitted into the Order Martinist and other collateral organizations. In the Spiritualist and Masonic Congress 1908, in which it participates as Secretary of Office, comes to terms with Faber de Esserts, Patriarch of the Gnostic Church, which bears the name of Sinzius. René Gnon enters this organization with the name of Paling Genius. Here he meets two characters of remarkable open, mindedness, Champrinod L.E. on 1870-1925 and Albert Poo, Earl of Puvauerville 1862-1939, the first to come later in Islam with the name of Abdul Hakku, the second a former official the French army who had been admitted, rather rare case for a Westerner, during its destination in the Far East in Taoists' environments. Always in the same period the formation of Akur's Order of the Temple, directed by Gnan, this organization will have a short life, but cost its founder being excluded from groups led by Pappas. This period is also Gu Yi admission to the Masonic Lodge Th.E. Ba, 
under the Grand Lodge of France, the Scottish Rite. 1908 is the year to make some GUI, non trace the meeting with qualified representatives of traditional India. In 1909 he founded the magazine Gnosis, where his first letter, titled Appear the Demiurge, as well as articles on Freemasonry and, what is more important in that it demonstrates, how the Eastern doctrines had been completely assimilated by him at this time, the first drafts of the symbolism of the cross, the man and his becoming according to the Vedanta and principles of calculus. At the end of 1910 meets John Gustav Agelii, Swedish painter became Muslim by the name of Abdul Hadi near 1897, and linked to Tazawaf Islamic esotericism by Abdur Rahman Elish Elk Bershik. The magazine Gnosis longer published in February 1912. On 11 July the same year Rene Gnan marries in bliss with Ms. Berdlery and in the same year enters Islam. In the years 1913 to 1914 his encounter with the Hindu dates back Swami Naradmani, who procures documentation on the Theosophical Society. Between 1915 and 1919 he is a substitute at the College of St. Germain in Lay, he lies in bliss where his mother died in 1917, and is a professor of philosophy at Seti Fajaria. Returned to Bliss and then to Paris. In 1924 and until 1929 gives lessons of philosophy at the St. Louis course. This year a press conference in which participates with Ferdinand Asendowski, Polish, author of a chronicle journey through Mongolia and Tibet, that had aroused some interest a few years earlier, Gunzag Truck, Ren E. Grusset, takes place in Jacques Maritain. Also in 1924 the work appears East and West. 1925 sees its collaboration with the Catholic magazine Rignabit, led by R. P. and Eisen, which had been submitted by archaeologist Louis Charbonneau Lassay of Laugen. On 15 January 1928 his wife died. In this same year he began his regular collaboration with the magazine Le Voile Disses, which since 1933 will take the title Etudes Traditionels. In 1930 part to Cairo, where he definitively established, in 1934 espousing the daughter of Sheikh Mohammed Ibrahim, with whom he had four children two boys and two girls, one of them posthumously. The rest of his work of doctrinal clarification was made in the period of their stay in Egypt, period from 1930 to 1951, year in which dies on January 7th. René Gnan defines the modern world of his time, as degeneration and investment of the traditional world. On the one hand the decisive character of modernity is its anti-traditional character, its denial of any inheritance from the past and lack of recognition of any debt with wisdom or earlier culture. The classic opposition between East and West is not geographical but ideological and doctrinal. So you can say, somewhat paradoxically, that while Europe was traditional in the Middle Ages could be described as the Oriental from our current perspective. Similarly the current East, invested with Western thought, is no longer oriental as westernized or in other words de-oriented, if we take this symbolic and profound sense. Indeed, as warned René Gnan, the Middle Ages was closer to the Eastern and to our society in all its aspects or Indian civilization. In fact the traditional character of the Middle Ages ensured and guaranteed permanent contact and dialogue with both geographical and doctrinal East. The final conclusion of his work contained mainly in the reign of quantity and the signs of the times is that the condition of the modern world bears witness to the end of the current cycle of humanity, which symbolically indicate the same terms East and West. His written work can be divided into several thematic blocks, exhibition of oriental doctrines and metaphysical principles. Here they work as our general introduction to the study of Hindu doctrines his first book. He wrote on commission and as an introduction to tradition general, multiple states of being or principles of calculus, studies on symbolism and traditional orthodox interpretation, 
This section written numerous articles for the magazine Fall the Veil of Isis, that later would be called Journal of Traditional Studies. These articles were compiled by Michel Fivelson in the posthumous work Fundamental Symbols of Sacred Science and their Great Triad, testing for the primordial tradition, both current initiation and initiatory societies Freemasonry as historical, the king of the world, critical reflections on the modern world and Western society. Contrary to what might seem, Ren Ignan was very concerned about the present world. Based on a strong critique of Western society can be divided into three chronological stages in their decision stance on the issue, steps which correspond in turn to the three works mainly addressing the problem of modernity. East and West is the first, addresses the lack of comprehension and understanding between those two worlds we call East and West, condemned to understand if they want to annihilate each other and perish. René Gnon output inevitably defends this traditional opposition dialogue, as a way to achieve understanding between different cultures. It should be noted that despite Bertrand's a naive optimism as precursor, to bring this confrontation or conflict, that today is in the crossers of all enlists in the world today. The crisis of the modern world in the light of events succeeded in the interwar period René Gnon sees tempered his optimism, but does not abandon the idea, that the understanding between them and rectification in view to a return to normal in the West, are possible. Their analysis is based on trust preservation to some extent of the traditional spirit in the Far East, particularly in the Chinese and Indian cultures. The reign of quantity in the signs of the times is, S in doubt, its largest, most comprehensive, ambitious and accomplished work. His earlier optimism and confidence lead to a cold, hard analysis that dominates the pessimism and perhaps certain detachment about the fate of the current human civilization. Indeed, the world war leaves no room for hope or optimism. In this work analyzes René Gnon Western civilization based on the general principles of Vedanta, and placing it within the framework of the Four Ages Yuga's established tradition. The conclusions are as devastating as worrying suppose future. This thematic classification of the work of René Gnon is not rigorous, because in each work are contained belonging to the other fields. It would be futile to try to systematize a work as interdisciplinary and wants to open, unlike a philosophical system, which seeks always be complete and closed in on itself. His work is not intended as a closed, defined and finishing system but an open and multiple view of the world, full of suggestions and references to all fields. Jacqueline Louis Alexander St. Yves d'Ausenda Auski Alvedre and Ferdinand were the first to spread the description of Agartha. The Theosophist Helena Blavatsky maintains the opinion and belief that the kingdom of Agartha was founded by demigods from the planet Venus. The most fanciful esoteric doctrines delay its foundation until about 15 billion years ago. The idea of subterranean worlds may have been inspired by ancient religious beliefs as Hades, Sheol and Hell. The word is of Buddhist origin Agartha. It refers to the world or underground empire, whose existence Buddhists believe. They also believe that the subterranean world has millions of inhabitants and many cities, with Shambhala as its capital. There lives the supreme ruler of the empire, known in the East as the king of the world. It is believed that the Dalai Lama of Tibet is its representative on the surface. Transmits its messages using some secret underground tunnels that connect the world with Tibet. Brazil, in the west, and Tibet in the east, appear to be the two parts of the world where you can access more easily to the underworld. The famous artist, philosopher and Russian explorer Nicholas Ronorik who traveled Central Asia, claimed that Lhasa, the capital of Tibet, was connected by a tunnel with Shambhala city, capital of the subterranean empire of Agartha. The entrance to the tunnel was guarded by lamas, to which the Dalai Lama had been sworn to secrecy about their location. 
it was believed that there was a similar tunnel connecting the base of the Pyramid of Giza with the underworld, by which it is supposed to be able to establish contact with the gods of the underworld. Different giant statues of Egyptian gods and kings first and the Buddha, found throughout the East, represent the gods, underground who came to the surface, to help the human race. Were emissaries of Agarda, the subterranean paradise too, which all Buddhists want to reach. The Buddhist tradition says that the first colonization of Agarda occurred many thousands of years ago, when a holy man led underground to a tribe that disappeared. Gypsies are supposed to come from Agarda, which would explain its permanent transfers. To find the lost home? This reminds us of Noah, supposed to resided in Atlantis, and was saved from the flood that submerged the mythical island. It is believed that he led his group to the high plains of Brazil, where they settled in underground cities, connected with the surface through tunnels to escape the radioactive product waste of an alleged nuclear war believed started the Atlanteans. It is assumed that this underground civilization has many thousands of years. It is believed that Atlantis sank 11,500 years ago in states that are able to handle forces that we ignore, as evidenced by their flying ships operating with an unknown source of energy. Osendowski argues that the empire of Agarda consists of a network of underground cities, connected by tunnels, by passing vehicles at tremendous speeds both below ground and the ocean. These people live under the reign of a world government, led by the king of the world. Representing the descendants of the lost continent of Muli Maria and Atlantis, in addition to those of Hyperborea. Positive versions claim that at different times the gods of Agartha came to the surface to teach human beings, and save them from wars, disasters and destruction. Anyway there are several data seem to point to some less peaceful interventions. In the Hindu epic, the Ramayana, describes Rama, as an emissary from Agarda, which came in an air vehicle. Osiris was another underground god. According to Donnelly, in his book Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, the gods of old were the rulers of Atlantis and members of a race of demigods who ruled humanity. Before the destruction of their continent, they had already planned, they traveled in their flying ships to the underworld through the polar opening, where they still live. The Empire of Agard Osendowski wrote in his book Beasts, Men, Gods, extends through underground tunnels all over the world. In this book talks about the vast network of tunnels built by a prehistoric race of the remotest antiquity passing under oceans and continents, and the fast-traveling vehicles. The rule of speaking Osendowski and learned lamas of the Far East during his travels in Mongolia consists of underground cities beneath the Earth's crust. We must differentiate, these which are situated on the Assumption hollow center of the Earth. Therefore, there are two subterranean worlds, one more superficial and one in the center of the Earth. The writer O. C. Haganin, in his book on UFOs and the Underworld, believes that there are many underground cities in different depths, between the crust and the hollow interior. With respect to the inhabitants of these cities, writes, this other humanity has a high degree of civilization, economic and social organization and cultural and scientific progress. By comparison, the Earth's surface is a race of barbarians. In his book, Huganin also shows a diagram of the interior of the Earth, in which several underground cities at different depth levels, connected by tunnels, are observed. The immense described within cavities in the Earth. Where he got his information. He says Shambhala City, the capital of the underground empire, is at the center of the Earth instead of being near the solid crust. This underground world wrote, all underground caves of America are inhabited by ancient people, who disappeared from the world. These towns and regions where they live underground are under the same supreme authority of the king of the world. Both the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, were once home to the vast continents that then immersed, 
and its inhabitants found refuge in the underworld. The deep caverns are illuminated by a bright light that allows the growth of cereals and other vegetables and gives them a long life free of disease. In this world, there is a large population and many tribes. In his book The Coming Race, Bulwer Living describes one than ours, which exists in large cavities inside the earth, connected to the surface by long tunnels much more advanced civilization. These huge cavities are illuminated by a mysterious light that does not require lamps. This light kept plant life and allowed underground dwellers grow their own food. The people who were vegetarians and living describes possessed equipment that allowed them to fly instead of walking. They were free from disease and had a perfect social organization in which each received what he needed without exploitation of one another. It has not stopped us and Dowski accuse of having plagiarized St. Eve. First, there is what might seem unlikely in St. Eve himself as the affirmation of the existence of an underground world that extends its ramifications everywhere, under the continents and even under the oceans, and through which communications are established invisible among all regions of the earth. Moreover, Osendowski, which does not take into account this statement, declares that not even know what to think of it although attributed to various characters he has encountered in the course of their journey. There are also, on more particular points, the passage where the king of the world is represented at the tomb of his predecessor, the passage, where is the origin of the Bohemians, who have once lived in the Agartha, like many others still. The existence of peoples in trouble of which the Bohemians are one of the most outstanding examples is really something very mysterious, and that would need to be examined carefully. St. Eve says that there are times during the underground celebration of the cosmic mysteries, where travelers found in the desert stop, where the animals themselves remain silent. Dr. Arturo Rigfini says this could have some connection with the Panicus Timor of old.